Hello, everyone, and welcome to Swiss Re Institute Spotlights, a series on thought-provoking webinars and events produced by Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. Today's webinar is the third in our series and puts the spotlight on the construction industry in Europe and how it can tackle short-termism in the industry while better managing complex projects. My name is Emma Greer, and I'm joining you virtually at the Swiss Re Institute today in Torino. And we have three very distinguished experts and industry thought leaders, Carlo Ratti, Rene Schumann, and Guido Ben. Let's first maybe run through the agenda. So Professor Ratti is from MIT's Sensible City Lab and Carlo Raffia Sacchetti here in Turin and also in New York. Uh, he's going to launch our webinar to provide a bold outlook on the future of construction in Europe. He's going to address a few new ways of planning and building to deliver some provocative impulses that will hopefully make you think about a little bit your industry. His first input will be followed by Renee Schumann from Hoxie's Bicon, who will present how complex construction projects can be managed more holistically and also more efficiently by using modern planning methods. Finally, Swiss Re's Head of Engineering and Construction, Guido Benz, will give us new insights on the changing risk landscape in your construction industry and also how complex construction can be sufficiently funded. Each expert will speak for about seven minutes and then we'll invite them back for a short panel discussion to address some of my questions, some of your questions, and hopefully some questions for each other. Unfortunately, we can actually hear what you're saying on the other end, but on the left of your screen, there's a question field. So just submit your questions there at any time, and we'll address these uh, at the end. So we'll start by hearing from Carlo on the future of construction in Europe. Uh, Carlo is an architect and an engineer by training. He teaches at MIT, where he directs Principal City Lab. He's also the founding partner of an international design and innovation practice called Carlo Raffia Sacchetti, where I also work. Uh, so, Carlo, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Emma, and uh, <clears throat> you know, great being with all of you today. So, I only have a few minutes. I want to share with you <clears throat> uh, just a couple of thoughts. And you will hear more uh, in the next presentations uh, um, uh, by Rene, by Guido, about also the use of BIM. But more generally, I would like to say what happens when we have like a digital twin. We have a full digital representation of the built, the existing world. You know, that is going to change this at different levels. The first level is already happening now, is, uh, is used in, in many design offices all around the world, is that you, know, you can really manage the design process in an interesting way, new ways, a more efficient way. You can go seamlessly from digital to physical. But then really what this changes is that it allows you to have a common platform to go all the way from the initial sketch to when you go to do the different phases of design, uh, anything from schematic design, design development, construction drawing, then the same platform can help you to build and then to operate what you've done. So it becomes this kind of common thread that actually allows you to manage the physical world and to simulate it, to see how you, know, you can anticipate possible issues, somehow to de-risk the whole process because you've got a common interface. A lot of the mistakes we've seen in the past decades, but always in constructions, and also a lot of the risk that we've seen usually happens because we traditionally had different representations. And changing from one representation system to another one is where, you know, sometimes there's uh, an issue of compatibility or, you know, or mistakes are generated and that can create much more risk in the whole process. So the first thing I want to, to, to share with you is this idea that we can go from the very beginning to the very end using, you know, the same digital platform. Uh, but the other thing, which is what we are now developing on this project, which is called Milan Innovation District, is a big development by Australian developer Langley. It is, you know, when you have this common platform to do all of this, well, can we then think about architecture as divided into different layers, and we can then manage them differently and de-risk them in a different way? So if you look at this project, which is around a million square meters, 
Um, then, uh, you know, here you have some infrastructure we're doing today that will last for 100 years. We have some other infrastructure that will last for 50 years. And we have some other things, maybe facades that we might change in, in 20 years, where new tenants might come into the building. And so the question is, can you use the BIM? And this, has, as far as we know, has never been done uh, yet. Uh, can we use the BIM in order to actually look at the different layers? And uh, here we see another image of the site, by the way, um, that uh, is divided into different layers. And then we can manage each of them in a different way. They could also be packaged into different funds because if you build something with a 100-year return, clearly, you know, what you want to get uh, is different from that. It's different from what you want to get from something that's built with a 10-year return. And, uh, and so you might want to package them into different financial instruments and funds, but also you can de-risk them in different ways. So finally, you can manage much better the, the, the process. But not only this, when you think about this kind of layering and coupling the layering with the finance of the project and the de-risking of the project, you can also solve another big issue we see today. And the issue is uh, here what you see is another image of the, of the project, which is a, an image where you see some self-driving cars. This is, we've been doing quite a few projects where we've been taking self-driving cars as a starting point. We've been working with Google's sister company, Sidewalk Lab in Toronto, to think about streets and how they change with self-driving cars. And here as well in this project, you know, the idea is that self-driving mobility will be at the core of the, of the project. Uh, here you see some other images, meanwhile, of the, of the site. Well, then when that is the case, you go a very uh, big risk in what you're doing today. You might build something, as I said before, that will last 20, 50, or 100 years. But we know, for instance, that in mobility, mobility is changing a different time frame. Mobility is changing a time frame that's uh, an order of magnitude faster, two, five, or 10 years. You know, think about 10 years ago, people didn't even talk about self-driving cars. And now everybody expects them to be the biggest revolution in mobility. So it's a different time frame. And then if you, if you look at this kind of structure with layers, it can help, it, help you to cope with different futures. Some things are more, uh, has, have more risk because they're more, they will change more rapidly because of uh, changing technologies and lifestyles. And so you can actually try to make sure that you take them out of uh, the entire development and yet, you know, perhaps think about a lower return at time from them because they might be changed because of technology. So you see some other images of the site here. Maybe let's go to the next one as well. Um, and I wanted to finish with, um, with the following, which is uh, another project we are doing in Singapore at the moment. It's uh, one of the tallest buildings in Singapore. And in this thing, I will not tell you too much about the, the architecture of the building, even if you are quite passionate about it. By the way, if you look at this, there's... Uh, uh, this kind of uh, amazing suspended plaza with a lot of trees overlooking the city it becomes like a public space suspended over Singapore. But the reason I'm showing it to you is, uh, is another point, which is exactly related to what I was saying before. Now, we sell driving car. Most people expect that we will not need parking. Very soon, that we need much less parking space. At the same time, we, this building hit construction a few months ago. And, um, you know, we still had to provide parking based on 20th century regulations. So what do you do? You build a huge parking infrastructure that maybe in 10 or 20 years might be obsolete. And then what we did here, we moved that onto a different layer, as I was saying before, we <clears throat> structured it in a different way. We changed a bit the design, so we actually did the floor to ceiling height a bit higher. And then we moved the ramps outside and we made the structure convertible so that that actually parking space tomorrow could become, as you see here, like a, a space for interaction, a space for offices or warehouses or galleries and other things. So that's really the important thing. In a nutshell, what I'm saying is that uh, by creating a digital twin, we can manage much better the process. It's not only the design process, it is now becoming more and more common today. It's the whole chain that goes from the initial sketch to the design, the, full, the old design phases, to construction, into utilization of uh, of the building. But then if we do something, this is really the innovative part where we actually structure this into different layers and we couple them with different financial instruments and we de-risk them in different ways, we can create an architecture that actually is much more resilient to the future, the uncertainty of the future, in particular, the uncertainty of the future of technology.
And uh, I will stop here and because just had a few minutes, but I'm leaving now to, uh, to the other speakers to give you a different perspective also, again, on BIM and some of the other changes in construction, and then look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. Super. Thanks, Carlo. Um, it's really great to, to think about BIM also for the management of the building. I think I've never really thought of it for more than just design and construction, but uh, maybe actually Renee will, will speak about that shortly. Uh, I'll keep my questions for the end, and just to remind you, if you have questions, please do put them in the, the question box so we can talk to, about them at uh, the panel discussion at the end. Next, to share his insights uh, on the planning of Renee is the Managing Director of Hospice Icon, a leading service provider for digitalization of business processes and BIM. Their headquarters is in Germany, but they work throughout Europe, the Middle East, and Australia. Renee ha was trained as a structural engineer and has been with Germany's largest construction company, Hospice, since 1998. Renee, over to you in Athens. Yes, thank you very much, Emma, uh, for the warm welcome. Hello, uh, everybody here from Essen in Germany. Um, I would like to come more to detail in terms of building information modeling and how it can be implemented uh, in your organization or how it can be implemented in future projects. Hochtief Icon is an organization that is absolutely dedicated to building information modeling. That is our core business. We don't do any other services like design or construction. Our core is really BIM. We help developing strategies. We realize those strategies and we educate as well um, organizations and people uh, working with uh, these new technologies. As uh, Carlo explained already a bit, building information modeling or digital twin, there are different terms running around the globe. Um, to explain it very shortly here, uh, when we talk about BIM, we talk about a digital model, a geometry. So design is not created in 2D drawings anymore. It is developed in digital 3D models and we link further information to the digital model. Further information can be the time schedule, uh, cost from the cost calculation, specifications from materials uh, or any other things. We include as well real-time data coming from sensors like temperatures, weather conditions, air conditions, and so on. And we take product information, product data coming from manufacturers. All that is digitally connected uh, on one platform, which is then the digital uh, model, as Carlo explained. Coming to the point how uh, you have a chance to take it over for your project or your business uh, at all, uh, there's always, there are always two sides. There's one external uh, uh, side, external influences, and there is the internal view. The internal view is more or less your uh, corporate or project capabilities. So I will explain a little bit what uh, each one of those is. Uh, external, for example, is uh, uh, the public authorities. Public authorities have already in place uh, a mandate for BIM in certain countries, not all over the world, but uh, in countries like Germany, uh, UK, United States, uh, also Switzerland, there are already BIM mandates coming from public authorities. And there are standards in place, depending on the country where you're working, um, there are uh, standards established. There is an international standard, the ISO 19650, um, about uh, information management and sharing. Uh, those standards are coming to our business and those ones have to be considered. And there's always a market view, competitors, uh, maybe partners in your project that uh, require you uh, to work a little bit more on uh, enhancing processes and maybe managing project risks better and being even more competitive in terms of budget and price. 
The internal view, that's a little bit more difficult than the external because the external cannot really be managed by you, uh, but the internal view is more or less that you focus on your own processes. Uh, we call it BIM use cases. So you identify those processes where you can utilize BIM methodologies within your projects. An example would be design coordination. The design coordination can be supported by a digital 3D model. And you identify how much effort would it be to establish a model-based process like design coordination within your project or organization and what benefits you expect from it. And you can then imagine that, of course, those use cases that are with, uh, let's say, minimum effort and maximum benefits that are the low-hanging fruits for your project, and those ones here maybe a lot efforts, less benefits are not. And then you can differentiate, okay, what kind of use cases I would like to implement for my project. You can separate between different stages and you make your implementation strategy. The question is, of course, how to come to the point to identify the, ben the benefits of each of the use cases within your processes. We are doing it with such matrices here that we identify in each process what is our expectation. First of all, what was the process without BIM, that is the blue line, and what is our expectation for the future if we use modern digital technologies, if we interlink uh, data to each other, if we have one single platform uh, for all building and construction data. And then we rate for each use case, uh, okay, there is expected a shorter uh, project construction duration, there's better management of customer requirements, we get better proposals, we avoid design conflicts, and so on. And then you see, okay, what is for each of the use case your uh, particular benefit. But this is always your own view. Coming back to my first slide I presented, uh, there is, of course, the top-down, the those elements that come from outside, and there's a lot going on uh, um, in different countries. Difficult to manage, but what you can manage is your internal capabilities, your bottom-up, your internal view. If you bring both in line, the top-down and your uh, bottom-up, then I believe you have a profitable BIM portfolio, then you can match the market requirements and uh, you are up to speed and um, yeah, you can deliver BIM uh, effectively. Thank you very much. I would now uh, push back to Emma. Thanks so much, Rene. That was really great. I've got a, a bunch of questions for you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be patient and, and wait for, for the end. Um, if anybody else has questions for Rene or Carlo, uh, don't forget to submit those via the question box. Now let's uh, take a look at how short-termism in construction can be addressed from the risk knowledge space, which Carlo touched on briefly, um, but will be elaborated on by our final speaker, Guido Benz, who is the Global Head of Engineering and Construction of Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. Prior to Swiss Re, he held various roles in the construction and engineering space, which included international projects for Holstein and ADB. Guido is a co-founder of the European Wind Turbine Committee, and in 2015 was elected to the Executive Committee of the International Machinery Insurance Association. Take it away, Guido. Thank you very much, Emma, for the very warm welcome. And uh, hello to everyone on the call. Pleasure to be here and uh, uh, being part of this, uh, this webinar today. Um, I would like to start off with a brief overview about how traditionally insurance comes into play on infrastructure projects, how the increasing complexity of projects changes the scenarios and the landscape from a risk uh, uh, exposure point of view, and how Swiss Corporate Solutions suggests to take a more holistic approach and use insurance not just as a service provider, but also as a strategic instrument to de-risk projects and potentially make them more bankable. And finally, to take a brief look at how technology-led innovation can change the risk landscape on infrastructure project insurance. So let me start with the um, first slide here. 
Um, <clears throat> if you look on the, on the right-hand side, I assume we will recognize a, a, a traditional project finance structure, which um, essentially sees insurance as one of many service providers for the whole project finance structure. So generally, insurance gets involved at a rather late stage of the financing process and typically takes a rather reactive role. So often this is more seen as a tick-the-box exercise um, to fulfill contractual obligations rather than a risk management tool to improve the viability of a uh, project uh, as a whole. So, so such reactive involvement of insurance might uh, have worked well for uh, simple government-sponsored projects, but I think in nowadays uh, uh, trend towards more complex projects, we definitely see some danger in that approach and also believe insurance could be uh, taken on board in a much more uh, strategic view. So if you look at the um, left-hand side of that slide, um, we can actually see, see how, <coughs> how the complexity of uh, uh, projects actually change. Starting with um, the more uh, modern uh, pro uh, the project delivery forms like public-private uh, public partnerships, BOT type uh, projects and so forth, to deliver crucial infrastructure projects. There's clearly a trend for governments of in, to involve the private sector more and change the risk of such large projects. At the same time, there comes along an increasing number of stakeholders with often conflicting interests that are there. And on the other hand, European contractors and developers are really venturing out into the world, taking on overseas exposures through investments, partnerships, or EPC contracts, which has an impact on shift of risk allocations throughout various uh, manufacturing sites, maybe, and actual construction sites. So again, an additional layer of complexity with new jurisdictions, overseas partners, and unknown exposures that are added to this uh, project risk landscape. The, at the same time, the increasing speed of innovation and adoption of new technologies in the delivery of projects results in more complexity and in whole new risks emerging uh, compared to the traditional insurance products that do not really cater for this new um, risk landscape. Cyber risk is just one of these uh, topics to be mentioned here. And when we look at the uh, capital situation, excess of capital chasing a limited number of um, um, infrastructure projects there is, the, on one hand, the infrastructure gap, which sums up at something like 15 uh, trillion uh, US dollars um, on a 2016 to 2040 projected investment into infrastructure. And on the other hand, there's also new lenders requirements that have come into play with Basel III and Basel IV that add new limitations and capital requirements. So having said this, the insurance industry has obviously a whole range of tried and tested products available that are geared towards individual exposures during the life cycle of a project. Either to protect physical assets, consequential financial losses, credit exposures, and legal liabilities. So clearly you can see there is a shift from historically the more tangible type exposures to increasingly more so to its intangible type of uh, assets that need to be addressed. So if we move on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> then we can see on the upper section of that slide that with the current approach, traditional approach, um, these exposures are mostly considered in isolation and resulting in a more fragmented uh, transfer, risk transfer solution. So contractual obligations here allocate the responsibilities for insurance to different parties. Different stakeholders have different interests and often only their own interest in mind. And policies are purchased at different points in time throughout the project life. So all this tends to result in a piecemeal of insurance policies exposing gaps and overlaps in the scope of cover. So resulting mirror of insurance opens the door for claim ambiguities and potential disputes among insurers. Now, <clears throat> we see the current model not being optimal uh, for project finance investments on one hand and believe there is more that can be done. So rather than focusing on the protection of revenue streams and ultimately debt servicing capabilities. So what Swissery is proposing with um, the more um, holistic approach, which you see in the lower section, we call this concept one construction, is to really take uh, a view from the beginning and partner in the fundamental structuring of a suitable risk finance program. So as illustrated in this slide, 
um, we're looking at uh, uh, getting involved on all these various uh, risk elements that you see uh, summarized on the left part of the lower section. So from construction and property insurance for SPVs and uh, O&N providers, surety bonds, SPI for contractors, LPRO-like products, contingent business interruption extensions, maybe parametric weather, solu weather solutions, or even capital enhancements uh, solutions to lenders via BTNI. However, um, um, it needs to be uh, made sure that they are uh, actually uh, uh, delivered in a, in a cohesive way and requires uh, to, to take a look at, at the insurance perspective with an early involvement of insurers to promote an integrated risk management approach throughout the project life cycle. So in essence, what we try to suggest here is really to look at it, uh, what Swiss Recorp Solutions can bring to the table in a, like a one-stop shop um, solution for project risk and combine traditional and non-traditional products into comprehensive seamless solutions. Now, moving on to the next slide, I think uh, looking at the, the um, uh, investments, technology-led inv innovations in construction, on one hand, we see on the left-hand side of this slide um, that con uh, construct tech startups are mainly focused on small-scale digital opportunities in construction. So we have mobile and, and cloud-based uh, technologies leveraging um, artificial intelligence, analytics, robotics, and uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, as well as software-based products related to BIM project management, as we've just heard from the colleagues before. So we see that uh, on one hand, and uh, we could say, okay, construction could one day be fully automated. Um, now, when the various technologies are combined, it could one day uh, really lead into unmanned construction and civil engineering sites, perhaps as soon as 2050. Some of you may have read that um, in uh, May 2016, the world's, world's first functioning uh, 3D printed office building was completed in Dubai, um, <clears throat> and there's more examples like that. Well, is such a radical disruption of the sector uh, likely? Maybe not in the very foreseeable future. But however, if we look at um, the um, adoption of dig digital technologies, and we're looking here now at the right-hand side of the slide, then it, it's clearly visible that some of the uh, new technologies are on the rise in construction and, and in and engineering, and some of them are really looked at with a high, uh, considered high level of technology readiness. And clearly the ones dominating here are on one hand prefabricated uh, components. We see, for instance, in the petrochem industry quite uh, a change from compared to how these projects were delivered in, in the past um, to what, what we observe nowadays, where we have a modular um, um, establishment and manufacturing and assembly in off-site locations and then transporting to final site and assembly on the spot. And that changes risk landscape uh, quite a bit. And at the same time also, as one of the uh, top right uh, uh, items there in terms of uh, technology readiness level achievement, clearly the integrated BIM um, methodology. So clearly, um, whilst this is still all on the, at the, uh, say in, the, in the early stages, um, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that we will see a majority of construction firms moving into that segment. Now, regulations too will help shape the uh, digital transformation. Uh, I think a number of governments actually already um, uh, moving into that segment to make uh, um, BIM as a, as a mandatory um, uh, uh, methodology for public infrastructure projects. And <clears throat> we may be talking about which counties these are later in the, in the call. Um, but it's fair to say that insurers need to stay abreast with these emerging uh, industry trends and the new methodologies and technologies to understand how they alter the nature of uh, underwritten risks, the way we assess these risks, the way we actually cost and, and develop and structure insurance programs to cater for these new technologies, and uh, basically also how we can uh, get ourselves involved in uh, manage uh, these risks from an insurance perspective and adapt the services that we can provide to the industry for successful delivery of these projects. I would like to uh, hand back to Emma at this stage and um, I think we're opening off for the discussion. So, Emma, please. Great. Thanks, Guido. Um, I would love to have a risk manager on our architectural team from the early concept phase. I imagine that would rule out a lot of problems that we run into the building and maintenance and management down, down the road. 
So thank you to all of our our three speakers. Now we'll, we'll move into the panel and, and, and Q&A discussion. Um, I have a few questions of my own, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start off with these as a, as an icebreaker, uh, and then we can take questions from the panelists or some of our participants online. So this first question, uh, initially had in mind for, for Carlo as he was speaking, but actually I think it, it could be applicable to, to all three of our speakers. As a young architect myself, I'm, I'm curious about how BIM will change the job landscape over my lifetime. And, and I would like to know maybe more from Carlo and, and from Rene, what in your view are the skill sets uh, that will be in high demand and which skill set might actually become obsolete. And I would expand that question to include Guido. What are the skill sets that we should bring on board for our design and construction team to implement Swiss Re's one construction method from the onset of a, of a project? Carlo, do you want to start off? <clears throat> sure. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to start. Uh, this is also uh, <clears throat> the related to the, the other question that you see here on the list um, <clears throat> uh, by asked by uh, Francesco. Um, so, <clears throat> so let, let me let me study first with Emma's point. Um, then uh, it uh, BIM also allows a lot of automation to be done, a lot of artificial intelligence to be used. I'll give you just one example. Um, last year we did a project that was in the main square of Milan exactly a year ago for the opening of Milan Design Week. It was a pavilion, it was all done in BIM. And so all the structure calculations were done automatically, just at the press of a button. This is today's technology, this is not the future. But if you look at a bit more artificial intelligence, you can think about uh, a few years from now, um, where most of the engineering work is done in an automated way. And it's about structure, it's about m &E, it's about a lot of the work of engineers. I think a lot of big engineering companies are, are really concerned about this. We've been doing some work with Arcadis, one of the largest one in the world, and really see this coming. So they want to understand what is going to, to happen. So the first thing I would say, how this is going to change the job market, I would say that a lot of tasks that are a bit, still a bit repetitive. A lot of engineering tasks, you know, they're the things that you do on an average building. I guess a lot of that will vanish with uh, AI. You might still have the great engineers, you know, when you need to do a, 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 a bridge with a huge span uh, or, you know, a special structure where you need some unconventional thinking, but a lot of conventional thinking would probably be completely automated on the BIM system for all what is, um, you know, the structure, m and &E's and so on. Um, so that's my first component. So going to back to Emma's question, I would say what I would do is try to do to focus uh, both on two components. The first component is uh, what is still very creative on the architect side, so what can be automated by, by AI bots. Um, and then the other thing I would do is really look at programming, because still, even if we do a lot of user such system, we need much more maintenance of them. We need to develop scripts like we do today. So I think the way to, to interface with this, we still need a lot of programming skills. So I think both the programming and the creativity seems to be, I, I would say, a safer bet than a lot of other tasks that could be more easily automated. And um, <clears throat> so if I look at uh, uh, the other question, sorry, I'm just going to the experience with BIM. What are the critical points and dangers to take into account when using this kind of uh, new technology? And I think this point about, you know, the competences of people are very, very important. I think today there's still a fragmented uh, chain. Uh, people use different systems. Uh, again, you know, this, uh, this fragmentation in system, in, in convention, in software, and uh, in, in people's uh, education, that is uh, probably the most critical thing we need to address. You know, you can do everything on a platform, and then maybe the, the people who are the building have a different one or don't have one yet. So I think it's like all transition phases. I think this kind of there's a need to start talking in quotes the same language, and so I think again, you know, developing these languages again and, and learning this language again, it would be a safe bet for Emma's question about what are some uh, some, some professions and skills that would be required tomorrow. Uh, I leave it. There are many other questions that are coming coming in, and I'm a few of them for 
some of the other presentations to Guido and Renee, so I'll pass it back to, to Emma. Great, so there'll be no more CAD monkeys in the industry. <laughs> That's to be avoided. Um, and we need to learn to speak this new language that moves from design to construction and eventually the management of, of buildings. Before we move to some of the other questions, I was hoping to hear from, from Renee and, and Guido. What are your thoughts? What are the skill sets of the future design and construction project for young professionals such as myself? Yeah. One of the um, <clears throat> big changes uh, uh, that comes with BIM finally in the project is that uh, we have a collaborative approach in projects. And that is something absolutely new for our industry. So we are used to work in silos. And I think that will, uh, it, it is a big change in the mentality of people, but a big change as well in how we educate in future our specialists. So. Uh, a close collaboration to different fields in architecture and construction is required in order to deliver complex projects on time uh, with a good price. And I, I think that is something our um, young people have to learn uh, from us, not to work in silos anymore, go a collaborative approach, develop in a modern environment which is technology-based, which is supported by artificial intelligence so that we have automated uh, processes involved. That is something for young people to get used to it and to learn how to do it better in a collaborative approach with more transparency and traceability uh, and not the way we do it today. Super, thanks. Maybe Peter, I can... Would you like to comment as well? Uh, yes, um, maybe I'd like to chip in with a viewpoint from an insurance perspective. I think when we look at um, the skill set in the teams today, in our teams, in underwriting such type of projects, then we have typically engineers who have been in construction projects, on construction sites, or testing commissioning jobs um, in the, in the old-fashioned way, most probably. Um, and I think when we're looking at the, the new technologies going forward, then clearly the entire aspect of um, data modeling capabilities uh, becomes very, very uh, prominent on one hand. I think my colleague from uh, Hochtief just now mentioned about the uh, silo operation and the collaborative uh, approach. I think with uh, modern technologies, the entire question of interface management between the various stakeholders in project delivery uh, teams becomes uh, equally uh, super critical. And, uh, is a skill or uh, an understanding that uh, people that underwrite such type of risk should uh, actually come with it. And I recall um, a recent study by Deloitte. When we look at um, mega projects from the past, you know, they, they, say, they say nine out of 10 projects have actually cost overruns. Um, out of uh, a billion dollar invested into infrastructure project, is typically historically um, 100 million dollars in excess of that. So the question, of course, is with modern technologies like BIM, can that be significantly and sustainably um, improved? Does it mean we are uh, less uh, looking at these type of uh, challenges with um, with modern infrastructure project deliveries. And when I look at the project that we lead as an insurer, which is Crossrail, um, one of uh, Europe's biggest uh, construction projects, which started in 2009, right at the very beginning with the project team and the, and the client in discussions, uh, the, one of the topics was how to manage a huge amount of data that they were collecting. This project is delivered on a fully digitalized platform and comes with thousands and thousands of data from sensors, from project management uh, across all the five, six dimensions. And, and one of the challenges was really how to manage all these data. And I think understanding that, how to, how to leverage that uh, for successful project delivery will become a critical uh, element also from an underwriting perspective, how we can assess it, such type of risks. Um, because they change also, of course, um, the, the point I made, made earlier on from the more tangible uh, exposures to potentially intangible um, um, exposures with financial consequential losses, with loss of data, for instance, and the entire elements that uh, tie into this. So I think we have a lot of questions. I'll pass them back to Emma. 
I will just ask one last question of my own, and then I will, I will, I will let our audience um, take the stage, so to speak. Uh, and it's related to the last point that you that you made, Guido, about the amount of data that we have on building projects growing exponentially, and to a certain degree reducing the number of unknowns. The more data we collect, the more we know about the project and its context, we may be able to avoid cost overrun. But as data analytics and predictive modeling become more advanced with this new workforce of uh, sophisticated young professionals who can do data modeling and manage the interface, do you foresee a future where insurance policies become very much automated uh, based on, on incoming data and, and brokers become obsolete? Thank you, Emma. That's a very interesting question. I think first part first, maybe. I think clearly there is a, a, a change, a major shift happening as we, as we speak, basically. And, and I think it's about... Um, Utilizing these data, utilizing modern technologies to allow for um, assessment and uh, um, interpretation of data and uh, statistical values to be able to assess risks in a better way. I think from a, um, from a project delivery perspective, clearly we would expect the quality and the methodologies that are available today to see higher success rates, so better quality, higher reliability, um, maybe uh, from an from a, uh, availability point of view, better um, ratios that can be achieved. We try to use such uh, information in terms of assessing risks and then being able to, to um, develop and enhance insurance products to take uh, uh, into account such new, better information that we have today. Critical element is data quality and reliability of these data, but if that is there, I think that does offer new opportunities. Now, to your second part of the question, will it make brokers um, obsolete? I think, <clears throat> actually, what I, what I personally um, um, seem to, uh, to uh, observe in the market, I think there is a race for the data, actually, because I believe going forward in, in the insurance world, who has control over the data will be in a stronger position. And I would say it's, uh, it's undecided at this point. I think brokers get a lot of insights uh, from a whole variety of clients, and if they manage the data well and, and uh, in, a, in a smart way, I think they can be in a very powerful um, uh, position. And I think what it will allow to, to, uh, to do is to provide very cost-efficient uh, ways and approaches to deliver insurance protection to projects. So just using the data in, a, in an effective way. So I think it will not replace or make brokers obsolete necessarily, but it can change the nature of the role of brokers. Likewise, I think uh, from, uh, from an insurance perspective, the same would apply in the sense of the better we can uh, uh, manage the quality of the data and interpretation of these data, the more uh, um, the more um, in a, the, the better in the position we are to actually cost risk, evaluate exposures that we run, that we take on our book when we insure projects like, well, like major infrastructure projects. And I think uh, being able to, um, to tailor products that maybe push the limits of insurability a bit further is one element, using data to actually um, be able to, to provide more, go closer to the, to the limits, provided our, the, our data, our insights can, can demonstrate that we actually are able to model such type of exposures better than we were in the past. So I think there's, there's something for both uh, sides of the, of the sort of value chain in an insurance uh, placement of a major infrastructure project. Um, it's just about how to, how to be able to best leverage the data and, of course, I think getting hold of the data. That's not always that simple and straightforward, but I think that's, that's a, a decisive factor in this uh, equation. Super fascinating stuff. So data is king. Um, I, I will now uh, turn to some of the questions from the audience. And I, I've chosen a, a first one uh, of, about how BIM can inform risk management. And I'll pass the question first to Renee and then to Guido. In the relation to climate change, 
and adaptation for the future. So we had just discussed how data can help us understand the present situation, but despite all of the data we have and the climate models we have, we haven't always been able to foresee extreme weather patterns or disruptive technologies that have changed the future. So I'm curious to know, uh, as our attendee is, how BIM can inform risk management in the face of climate change and uh, a sort of uncertain future. So I'll pass it first to Renee and then, and then to Guido. Yeah. So when we work with, uh, <clears throat> with digital twins, that means all project information on one platform. That means also that we get a better chance to assess project information, we can better assess project risks also. Uh, in terms of climate change, we don't know exactly what will happen in terms of, for example, weather conditions. Um, of course, we can, let's say, simulate uh, circumstances, we can simulate weather conditions uh, on a project, what would happen if. Um, and I think that it's much easier if we work with a digital set of data, which allows uh, coming from a different perspective because a construction company would maybe uh, assess the project from a different point of view. They are more looking for the carbon footprint. They are looking uh, uh, what is the um, um, waste production now uh, during the construction process. Uh, if somebody else would look from, from a different perspective, maybe the facility manager would say, what is my um, future energy consumption uh, under uh, the weather conditions uh, expected, in, uh, inspected, inspected in the next uh, 30 years? So we have absolutely different views on the building and the digital twin allows those views and assessments on the project. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the assessments a risk manager from a construction company would do is absolutely different than a risk manager from uh, a public works authority would do for a project. And maybe each one of those has no clue exactly what they are really uh, assessed there. And therefore, I believe that uh, digital data allow different views on the project and allow as well simulation of particular circumstances we create, first of all, in a computer before they happen already on site. So, and uh, all together, I believe that with uh, building information modeling and creating digital twins, risk assessment is uh, much better than ever before. Super. So you recommend to simulate extreme weather patterns on a digital twin and to analyze these simulations with a multidisciplinary team from the get-go using, using BIM. We do anything to add on this topic? I think just a few points really, but I believe it's generally um, a, matter, a measure to arrive at more effective resource deployment. So I think um, redundancies should be less, um, waste of resources should be less. Um, I think from an operational perspective, uh, unplanned shutdowns or, or basically using uh, data and, and information um, for preventive, uh, maintenance preventive modeling um, contributes in uh, minimizing the CO2 footprint, you know, to, to basically help optimize fuel consumption or prevent maybe oil spills, things like that. Does it uh, change it entirely? I think it can contribute, but I think it's been by itself will not be sufficient to, to, uh, to uh, control that type of uh, exposure. Super, thanks so much. I'm going to push, push to the main slide an, another question about the implementation of BIM, principally for, for you, Renee. Uh, what are the biggest risks 
associated with the implementation of BIM to an owner and to the to the contractor. What what lessons have you learned from your your experience in Europe and and abroad? For instance, is there a certain size that makes sense for BIM, whereas another project less so? Yeah. Um, yeah, a question that comes often, what are risks, what are benefits? Um, the risk is, from my point of view, what we learned is that as an investor, as an owner, uh, that you are not creating your own digital island. Uh, I think that is quite difficult. In the industry, we are speaking from open and closed BIM. Uh, open BIM approach means that you really consider and uh, uh, you consider an open approach and allow different systems that can be used to provide services. And I think that is quite important to take that into account when you define your corporate or project specific standards that you do it in a way that most of the industry partners can fulfill your requirements. If you limit your uh, subcontractors or your partners on a project because of your digital strategy, it would be an additional risk and a weakness maybe that uh, you don't get the competition you are really looking for. Um, so therefore, from my point of view, it is important to develop as long as we don't have national standards in place and uh, most of the countries don't have national standards in place uh, that you define as an owner standards in a way that can uh, support designers and contractors Maybe you do it together in a collaborative approach. That is what we see often, uh, that uh, public authorities ask the industry, please come and help to develop a, a, a standard uh, for my future projects in a way that we can do it together. And I think that is the best way to do it, not creating an island, uh, select or choose a collaborative approach and develop a standard that can be fulfilled by smaller companies as well as uh, bigger companies you know, because this competition is needed to do uh, good projects. And in terms maybe a second part of your question, Emma, um, um, the size of projects, um, of course, uh, the bigger uh, the project, uh, the more benefits you can have uh, with digital data. Um, that's absolutely clear, but uh, I can say even for a small project like a villa or so, it makes sense to think about a new way of working. So if, if you see how construction is, is, is done in our days, uh, it can't be the right way. So there's, uh, there are many, many fields for improvements and those improvements can be done in small projects as well as in bigger projects. Of course, the, the use cases, so what exactly um, uh, comes into place for bigger projects is a little, little different than in smaller ones, but uh, the methodology at all can be used for small and for big, big projects in the same way. That's great. Our office used a private villa actually as a sort of warm-up exercise to coach our team on using BIM in our workflow and it was hugely beneficial to the project. We're running short on time but I'll ask one one last question to Carlo um, which came to mind when he was talking about a single interface throughout the lifetime of a building. Uh, I've worked with BIM during design and construction phases, but I had never thought of it as a tool for the management and maintenance. What would you say is the benefits of using BIM in the post-occupancy phase, Carlo? Yeah, thank you for asking, Emma. I, I would say there's um, at least two components. Uh, one component is that you know you can really take care of the building better. You can monitor it and monitor the structure of the building. So again, that can help you to de-risk it and to to manage better risk. Um, you can uh, you can really use it to see how the mechanical system work and so on. So basically, it's about monitoring the building itself, and so you can better maintain it. And after after you can somehow you can move architecture from the curative to the preventative. Now the other thing, however, is that you can actually monitor and see where people are. 
And it's happening more and more. You know, WeWork is doing a lot of that. We've been doing a lot of that in many co-working spaces. So when you have occupancy in real time, that, uh, again, can go on the same digital platform. It can help you understand what works, what doesn't work in architecture, and how you, you can improve it. So I would say these two components are monitoring the building itself, monitoring life inside the building so then you can better use every square meter uh, uh, that you have and really you know go from the thinking in the past few years we've gone from you know in the past maybe a couple of decades from the old model it was people selling square meters uh, today people tend to give you a service think about the co-working they give you a desk and a place to do things but to a future where really you provide through architecture a way that we can be more productive and do what we want to do. So in architecture, that's really based on, on the allowing people, it's not only the architecture, but everything and the monitoring and the, and the beam becomes part of it that helps to really helps us achieve what we want to achieve. So really selling that service, which uh, can make us as a, as a company, as a group, as a team of individuals, more productive. And I know we, we only have a couple of minutes, so I want to say thank you, everybody. A very exciting discussion. Looking forward to continue. <laughs> Apologies, I need that to continue, continue it. Super, thanks, Carlo. Um, that's all the time we, we have for today. Uh, if you submitted a question and it was answered, uh, no worries, we'll reach out to you through your SwiftU client manager. Um, if you would join me please in thanking Carlo, Rene, and Guido for their participation today and wishing them success in their endeavors. We'd like to keep in touch with you, so please do keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a recorded version of this webinar. I know some participants were asking about sharing the slides, um, so you can share this webinar with your, with your colleagues or with your, with your clients. Um, we'll also include a link to the Institute's webpage where you can find more information about upcoming events and publications, including our next Spotlight webinar with Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. On that note, we'll finish up. On behalf of the Swiss Re Institute and Corporate Solutions webinar team, I'd like to thank you for joining us and have a great day and the rest of your week.